want to welcome everyone here today on this beautiful morning um, in Southern Illinois on our beautiful campus of SIUC. Um, thank you for, for coming today. Um, I'm very excited to um, have Dr. Grand in here. Um, I think we're honored to have her here um, to um, talk to us about um, the research that she's worked on throughout her career um, and her life experiences that we'll hear about this evening as well. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to welcome to the stage our Chancellor, Chancellor John Dunn, to give some welcoming remarks. So thank you all. Wow, what a great crowd. Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very, very much. What a special treat to have you here. Uh, it's my pleasure as the Chancellor of the University to welcome you, uh, to let you know that you uh, are home and that you are always welcome on this great, great university campus. I do want to special acknowledgement uh, to our teachers who are here with these students, the work that you do each and every day to help promote, develop, mentor, and shape the future of our students, and how important these young people are to the future of the state of Illinois and the United States and the world. I also want to acknowledge we have a lot of faculty and staff here, as well as SIU Carbondale students, and thank you too for joining us this morning. Uh, we've already acknowledged Dr. Gil uh, Kronick, but uh, I don't think it hurts to do that once again uh, because it's through good philanthropy. And Dr. Kronick knows this well and his wife, Jean. Uh, they give, they believe in, and they believe in you. And so how about another nice round of applause for uh, Gil Kronick? Thank you, Gil. We're also, also very, very pleased to have one of the most prominent individuals in the United States on everybody's in the world top 100 list, and that's uh, our speaker today that you'll have the opportunity to hear from a little bit later, and the great work that she has done uh, living her life, also helping to promote the, and help all of us understand more about autism and the autism spectrum disorder but also the importance of animals and uh, their welfare. And that's, uh, of course, Dr. Temple uh, Graden. Uh, Temple, thank you for being with us. Yeah, you want to stand? Yeah, let's give her a no, no. Oh, I have to wait. I yeah, yeah, no, 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 I messed you up here, right. No, no, stay here, though, stay here. All right. Yeah, that way we'll get more uh, stage time with uh, Dr. Gratton. So uh, I had a good idea there, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do want to brag a little bit about our College of Agriculture. Um, we are a leaner, leader in many ways, but certainly in sustainable research. We've got a green roof on the Ag Building. We've got Sustainable Farm, a Vermi composting uh, center or facility. And our research areas include biofuels, forestry, environmental sustainability, water quality, how important that is, energy policy, as well as health and nutrition. The campus itself, your campus, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, we have a silver ranking uh, from the sustainability tracking. That's an important assessment that universities engage in. Some do. We choose to do so because we're serious about making sure that we are on course and on track, always improving in our commitment to sustainability. We're also a bicycle friendly uh, university that's anointed by the League of American Cyclists. And we're a tree campus USA, and that should be of no surprise to anyone that's ever been on this campus. If you want to identify the most beautiful campus in the state of Illinois, it's Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And our commitment to trees and making sure that our en environment is conducive to good, good learning for all of us. And hands-on learning opportunities. We've got 2,000 acres of university farms that we're thinking about each day, trying to figure out how to 
uh, that uh, to enhance, improve, and we need uh, to continue on that path. We have featuring crops and animal production, beef and equine centers, greenhouses and agronomic uh, uh, research centers, vast resources, the Shawnee National Forest. That, by the way, could be a good question to put on our next uh, uh, Kahoot is how many, how many, how many national forests are there in the state of Illinois? Uno, right? One. Shawnee National Forest right here, and you're part of that right now. And of course, in the College of Agricultural Sciences, access to specialized farming, including Southern Illinois, growing wine and fruit country. And I also want to say that students, uh, excellent faculty and staff here, people who care about you, who want to make sure that we do it right, that we understand that really it's about you, the institution is important, the college is important, but nothing's more important, the most important variable on any university campus, and certainly here, is the student. And we want to make sure that you're treated well, always treated right and respectfully, and that you get, uh, as you deserve, a great, great education. We ask you to please explore, think about us. You're always welcome to visit again. And if you ever want to make connection and you can't find any other way to do it, my email comes directly to me. I answer my own. I do it every day, jmdunn at siu.edu. jmdunn, d-u-n-n, at siu.edu. So if you send me an email, I may not know uh, all the answers because I have limited capacity upstairs, but I will know where to go to make sure that you get the answer that you deserve. So just think about jmdunn at siu.edu. And with that, I think we have another uh, presenter who's going to do an introduction uh, of our, uh, yes, thank you, you're here, do an introduction of our special guest today, and that's what the real program is about. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shaylee Clinton, and I am a sophomore here at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, majoring in agriculture education. It is an honor and a privilege to be a Saluki in the College of Agriculture Sciences, but an even greater opportunity and greater honor is that of which we all have here today. Today, we have the opportunity of a lifetime to hear from one of the greatest minds our generation has ever seen. A professor of animal science at Colorado State University, she has been a pioneer in improving livestock handling and welfare. She was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and has faced many challenges in her life then on. At age two, she had no speech and showed all signs of severe autism. In her teenage years, she faced constant bullying and teasing. However, because of mentoring from her high school science teacher and her aunt, she felt motivated to pursue a career as a scientist and a livestock equipment designer. She obtained her bachelor's degree at Franklin Pierce College in 1970, master's at Arizona State University in 1975, and was awarded her PhD from the University of Illinois in 1989. She has done extensive work on the design of handling facilities and has published several hundred industry articles, book chapters, technical papers on animal handling, plus 73 re referee journal articles in addition to 12 books. She has received numerous awards, including the Meritorious Achievement Award from the Livestock Conservation Institute, named a distinguished alumni member at Franklin Pierce College and received her honorary doctorate degree from McGill University, the University of Illinois, Texas A&M, Carnegie Mellon University, and Duke University. She is a past member of the Autism Society of America and lectures to parents and teachers throughout the United States on her experiences with autism. Let's please give a warm Saluki welcome to the astounding Dr. Temple Grandin.
Well, it's great to be here. I didn't mean to walk up uh, too early. I was just kind of jumping my cue. Okay, you now all know that I had autism as a kid. And autism is an important part of who I am. But the livestock, uh, cattle, and the pigs, they come first. And I think this is a really important thing about identity. I'm seeing too many people today where they're just totally becoming their disability. And when I was out working on the meatpacking plant design, I have worked for every single major meat company in heavy construction because I would sell that job, I'd do the drawings for the job, supervise the construction, and start it up. And let me tell you who builds this stuff in these big food processing plants, the special ed department. And the problem is they're not getting replaced. I can't do tonight's talk right now. We're going to be do ca doing cattle. But um, sometimes there's just some really basic things to, with cattle handling that I still have to talk about over the years, things like handling small groups. Now, I often get asked, how did autism help me with cattle handling? I am an extreme visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture, so I don't have abstract thought. I've been invited here by the Public Policy Institute. There's a lot of stuff going on right now, and it's not abstract with me. Visual thinkers can see solutions to problems, like doing something to improve cattle handling, and maybe even some bigger problems that need to be thought about in a way that is not abstract. Now, I find that I still have to constantly keep telling people to move small groups of cattle. Now, a basic principle in animals is a calm animal is going to be easier to handle. So how do you know whether your horse or your cow is calm? If it's calm, there'll be no tail switching. That's your first sign. A horse is going to bite, cattle going to kick you. Ears are pinned back. Now, I forgot to put on this slide pooping. Yeah, because you scared the poop out of them. Your animal's really getting stressed. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of interest now in low-stress cattle handling. But back when I started in the 70s, there wasn't. Also, being a woman in a man's industry in the 70s was a much bigger obstacle than uh, autism ever was. But I want to see these kids that are different getting out doing things. I worked with people that were dyslexic, ADHD, uh, mildly autistic, on building these big plants. Right now, we're importing the equipment over here in 100 shipping containers per plant because we don't know how to build it, because they took skilled trades out of the schools. Worst thing they ever did. I'm glad you got your funding back for FFA. I'm really glad to find out about that. Now, the very first work I did with cattle is it seemed obvious to look at what animals were seeing when they walked through the chute. And when I first started, I didn't know that other people were not visual thinkers. I thought everybody was a visual thinker who thought like in photographic pictures. And you, there might be a piece of chain hanging down in the chute, and they would refuse to um, walk by the chain, or a coat on a fence, or vehicles parked next to the fence. Why weren't other people seeing this? Well, I now know, but back in the 70s, I didn't. Look for things like changes in flooring. Animals will stop where there's a change in flooring. And what you want to do is give your leader animal a chance to put the head down and take a little look. Wait for him to bring the head back up. Let your animal look. Let your leader look. Then wait for it to put the head back up. Then you push it. Observation. I want to teach you how to be better at observation. Observation is also a very important part of science. I used to fight with my old professor about that. He said the only thing that was science was a controlled experiment. And I go, what's the Hubble Space Telescope? Is the control pointing it at the ground? I don't know, maybe its ancestor was a spy satellite, so that's the control for the Hubble Space Telescope. Things like reflections on the wet floors, time of day effects. These are things that all affect how the animals move. Uh, they tend to move towards the light, but they won't go into blinding light. Get down in that chute and see what they're seeing. People thought that was crazy when I did that in the 70s. It's completely, absolutely crazy. You can see people through the fence. You can see some shadows there. Now, how many people noticed, this is a test of observation, that those black and white cattle were not walking on the sunbeam? That's the kind of thing I want you to see. Now, if you saw it before I told you, raise your hand. Oh, no. You know what I'm afraid of? We've weeded out the visual thinkers because they can't do algebra. 
Visual thinkers cannot do algebra, but you need us. So how did I manage to get through college without algebra? Because in 67, they had this special course called finite math, matrices, probability, and statistics. But we need visual thinkers. We got some big messes like the Boeing Max airplane mess. That was a visual thinking mistake and a real obvious one. Now, there were other stuff they did wrong, too, like not training pilots. But there was a very, very serious, very simple visual thinking mistake. Now, there are certain problems that need to be solved visually. Now, we need our mathematicians, too. Because to make something like the iPhone, visual thinker made the interface. The mathematician had to make the phone work. So that's the different minds working together. So at this particular feed yard, the cattle absolutely refused to go in the building because it's sunny outside. It's like a dark movie theater inside. Now at night, this same facility will work perfectly because I light it up with lights. They'll go right in at night. It will work great. On a sunny day, it's horrible. <coughs> and what I got to do is get light, more light coming through the building. That will make it work. Now this is one of the big slaughter plants that I worked with. And people always ask me, are the cows afraid of getting slaughtered? They're more afraid of the people standing where they shouldn't be standing. And you got the guy there with the aviator mirror sunglasses, super big eyes. That's going to make them stop. I have found that a paper towel going like this will about shut off a slaughter plant, a great big beef plant. It's what they see. And I found if I could control what they see, they just walk right in there. I've also got to make sure that people aren't yelling and screaming at cattle and getting them all upset. This next um, slide shows some of my uh, pictures of handling facilities. Now, the thing that people always ask me is, how did you sell yourself a job since people with autism are terrible at interviewing? What I basically did is I just put pictures of my projects down on the table and I showed them my work. I sold my work, not myself. That was really, really an important thing for me. And when I showed them pictures, uh, they were impressed. And you might wonder why curved. Cattle have an, and pigs have a natural behavior to go back to where they come from. That's why pigs will sometimes try to get back on the truck. That's the behavior of going back to where you come from. Now, this just shows two of my facilities. Layout's really important. Now, you want to do layout, you can go to grandin.com. I've got some books on cattle handling. I've got a new one, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. I wish we had it here to sell, but we don't. Uh, and a lot of nice pictures. Then my other book on humane handling has got all the cool welding projects for you to do. Because you get really good at welding and really good at making things. You have a job for the rest of your life. The skilled trades are not getting replaced by computers. And what's really stupid, and I read every business magazine that there is. What do I do on planes? I read. I read, read, read. I'll buy three magazines, two newspapers. That's about right for a four-hour flight. And I've read all the stuff about computers and what they're going to replace. And they leave the skilled trades out. Artificial intelligence can replace the doctor's diagnostic ability in the hospital. It won't fix the air conditioning system. It's not going to fix trucks or the self-driving cars. You still got to fix stuff. People still got to build stuff. That's not going to go away. So take those welding classes. Get really good at making stuff. That's something we need to be doing. But you've got to lay these facilities out correctly. That's on my website for free, or it's in my books. Now let's just look at some behavior things. Again, observation. I put this slide up here. You notice how there's like a bubble around the people? That's the flight zone in a sheep. Cattle would do the same thing if I had a big bunch of cattle. And the size of that bubble is affected by genetics and their previous experience. If they've been yelled and screamed at, that bubble will be bigger. The first thing you've got to do in cattle handling is calm down. Because you get them all excited, it takes half an hour to calm down. Now, when cattle get excited, it's due to fear. Fear is the thing that, that makes cattle get excited when you're handling them. You work with your animals and walk amongst them, the flight zone will go down. If you raise pegs, also, you need to get pigs when you walk um, on the farm used to people walking through them, so they'll be easy to load. But you can see that bubble there. That's the flight zone. Now, here's a handy-dandy way to get an animal to move forward in a into the squeeze chute. And this is something that looks very counterintuitive, because you walk back by them in the opposite direction. It works. You do kind of a quick movement. It works. 
This is an example of using a hardwired behavior that cattle have to avoid predators, <coughs> and you use it to get them to move forward. You quickly walk back by the shoulder. Now, what you don't want to do, and I see a lot of people do this, is they'll stand at the head of the cattle and take a paddle and poke it on the butt. No, that's not the thing to do. That doesn't work. Right there, I'm just using a little flag there to turn an animal. One of the big mistakes that people make with driving aids is they keep doing this. So some of the people now teaching low stress handling recommend no driving aids because that's the only way to get people to stop doing this. Constantly waving it. You know, learn how to use small movements to get them to move. Another basic principle when you're working with animals is when they're going where you want them to go, back off out of the flight zone. Give them a reward. They do what you want them to do, you back off. You don't just keep pushing them. And I just got back from Brazil, and they've got these um, Nalori cattle. They're kind of a gray Brahmin type of cattle, very flighty. And we couldn't get some of them into the cattle handling facility because it was a, a backlit really badly with the sun. Now, that leader was just getting ready to go. And I found, even myself, and I know better, I had to resist the urge to give an extra push. When that leader's just starting to go where I want him to go, this is when you back off a bit. And you resist the urge to push. I wanted to push. I had to fight it. You see, to really do it right, you've got to change some of your own natures. This shows correct amount of cattle put in a round crowd pen. Biggest mistake people make is to bring too many up at a time. They pack everything solid full of cattle, and then everybody just turns around. Total mess. What you want to do is wait until you've got some space in your single file, then you just bring them on around, and they just keep on going. You don't pack the thing solid and let those cattle turn around. That's timing your bunches. And notice I'm not squashing them with the crowd gate. I just put it on the first notch. Now, there's a really nice little simple cattle handling facility. We got a lot of people now using rented or leased ground, need to do cattle handling facilities out of portable panels. And then Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals, I've got um, lots of designs that will work with portable panels. And this one right here, instead of having all the catwalks, you just stand at the pivot of the gate, and they'll come right around you. Come right around you, and you can set this up out of portable panels. Now, watch things like ear radar. Cattle and horses look at things with their ears. Where are they pointing it? Observation. What is it hearing? An animal lives in a sensory-based world. You want to understand animals, get away from language. You've got to totally get away from language. What is it hearing? Seeing. Now, smelling is important, but usually that's not so important for handling. Now, here are some behavioral principles of restraint. I can't emphasize enough non-slip flooring. And the problem with flooring is it wears out slowly, and people don't realize it's wearing out. If you have a hydraulic squeeze chute, don't squeeze them too hard. If they moo and you squeeze them, you're squeezing them too hard. If you calm your handling down, you can hold them in a manual squeeze chute just fine. Because you calm down everything you do in the back, then they come up <coughs> a whole lot calmer. And I'm really sorry, I'm getting over bronchitis. And I just ended up the last pill of a Ziframax antibiotic that came from Croatia. I looked up the city last night. It has a double tree in that gives out cookies. Then I went to their website, and they had to they're going to make me log in. They weren't going to let me see what the factory looked like. I have to say, I'm not feeling too good because I just took the last dose last night, and I'm not sure if it's going to work. That's not too good a thing to a good a situation to be into when it can turn into pneumonia. <coughs> and I might have to get a cough drop if I keep coughing. The next slide is the work that we did on cattle temperament. This is 25 years ago now. And when we first started the idea of selecting cattle for temperament, that's a common thing now. But 25 years ago, it was considered kind of crazy. And my student, Bridget Bosnay, found that the animals that went berserk in a squeeze chute had lower weight gain. That was crazy, radical stuff. But the thing we got to be careful about is we could over-select for temperament. You know, you, if you make them too calm, maybe they won't take care of their calves. And this brings up a really important principle in genetics. If you over-select for any single trait, you will wreck your animal. 
period. When you go crazy selecting for carcass, this was done in pigs 30 years ago when I was at the University of Illinois, the lean line hybrids came in. And we got a crazy pig with horrendous foot and leg conformation. Collapsed ankles, crisscrossed, uh, you know, crooked legs, post-legged, really bad. And 10 years ago, that started happening in Angus cattle, the same defects. And now the Angus Association has uh, leg conformation EPDs. But be careful on over-selecting for single traits. You've got the bulldog, that's an absolute total monstrosity that can't breathe and it can't walk. And it's, a num it's in the top 10 most popular dog breeds. I was horrified to read that. I think they're deformed freakazoids. Um, I don't think not being able to breathe and being able to walk is cute. Um, and the thing we got to be careful about on things like lameness is you can slip into it. I call it bad becoming normal. You get used to seeing them. Now here's a visual way to look at genetic selection. And if an animal is a country, you got a national budget. If I put the whole national budget into the economy, okay, big carcass, let's say, then I shortchange infrastructure, bone, heart. We've got high altitude sickness in cattle coming down to lower levels. I shortchange reproduction. Look at the dairy cow. The other thing I may be shortchanging is my military. That is your immune function, your ability to fight off disease. Nothing is free in this world. So you've got the economy, you've got the infrastructure, and then you've got the military. And your wild type animal's got a big military, but it's not very productive. You see, there's always trade-offs. People don't get it. There's an advantage to having been in the industry for 45 years. You know, three or four pig diseases came into being during my career that we were never seen to be a problem before. Now, the purpose of this slide is to show that when animals are forced to do something, you get a whole lot more stress, and that's going to be fear stress. And when animals voluntarily cooperate, then there's a lot less stress. And there's different kinds of stress. You have fear stress that happens during handling. Then you separate the cows from the calves. That's separation distress. That's actually a different emotional system in the brain. An animal's first experience with a new person, a new place, or a new piece of equipment should be good. So when you first introduce your horse to the horse trailer, let's make sure nothing goes wrong, like falling down and bashing their head. Because if that first experience is really bad, you might have a loading problem for quite a long time. If you put something novel down in the pen of feedlot cattle, they'll come up to it. Novelty is both scary and attractive. It's attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach. And it's scary when you shove it in their face. I don't know how many times people have said to me, oh, my horse was fine at home and he went berserk at the show. Or my steer got loose and it ran down the midway. That is often the animal that has led too sheltered a life. Let's get them used to flags, bikes, and balloons before you go to the show. And the best way to do that is to decorate the pasture with flags and let your animal voluntarily approach. Don't shove it in their face. And the animal that's lived too sheltered a life, with maybe just one person taking care of it, has flighty genetics, that's the one that when it goes to the fair, it's going to go crazy. Now, the thing that can be scary is a sudden novel stimulus, like an umbrella suddenly opening. That's an example of a sudden novel stimulus. Now, this breed of horse is so tame that very calm that not much happens. See, this is where genetics interacts with environment. When you're really going to see that genetic temperament, that flighty horse or flighty cattle, is when you suddenly shove novelty in its face. That's when you're gonna, it's going to show its genetics. Now, animal memories are specific because they are sensory-based. Animals differentiate between a man on the horse and a man on the ground. This is probably not going to be a problem here in Illinois, but out west, we've had some very serious accidents at meat plants because cattle met their first person on the ground at a meat plant. The man on the horse was familiar and safe. The man on the ground was scary and new. The flight zone like tripled in size, and they ran over a 50-year-old lady, stepped on her head, and killed her. 
So it's really important that they get used to different ways of being moved. And if you habituate a horse, for example, to a blue and white umbrella, that doesn't transfer to a tarp. Umbrellas and tarps, they look totally different. And flags look different than umbrellas. Now, I don't think I have to worry about the Illinois state flag versus the American flag. That's still a flag-like thing. It still has enough similarity. They have a little bit of an ability to generalize. Um, I have a student right now who's doing a little experiment with a children's play set, walking a horse by a plastic children's play set. Well, and she looked at maybe 25 different play sets online to pick one that would look very different when you rotate it. The horse treats it as a novel object. It would stop when it was rotated. Now, a person who thinks in words is going to look at it and go, yeah, play set. That's not going to hurt me. They'll know what it is. You see, that's where we've got a big computer sitting up here the horse doesn't have. But you rotate it to the horse, it just looks like something different. Yeah, you see, when you think in words, you overgeneralize. Yep, you know, man on the horse, man on the ground, uh, they're two different things. That's actually a feed yard in Arizona where I started. And uh, they got shade. When I first started, Cattle handling was atrocious, but the living conditions were good. That's the typical Arizona feedlot scene. I also went back and looked at some of my old slides, and we're putting twice as many cattle in the pens, and then they're getting dirty. And we got to look at welfare things. Filthy, dirty cattle, that's not okay. Now, the thing is, you manage things that you measure. I get asked all the time in the livestock industry, what do you think is the most important thing that you did? Now, my biggest, most important piece of equipment is a center track restrainer system. That is in all of the large beef plants. If you want to see it, you can look up Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin. There, there, I have journal articles online about it. And I put these systems in the big meat packing plants in the early 90s. But you know what was discouraging? Half my clients tore it up and wrecked it. That was very discouraging. Early in my career, I thought I could build self-managing cattle handling system. That's nonsense. It doesn't replace management. You cannot replace management with equipment. It's just that simple. And if you keep measuring things, then I can make sure that I aren't, I'm not getting worse. It's sort of like the police side monitoring speeding. They gotta keep doing it. And one of the issues came up about the dairy that got in trouble for abusing calves. And the owner of the dairy came on and he said, I made a mistake. Training the employees was not enough. I'm going to have to monitor with video cameras. It's just like traffic. You took driver's ed years ago. But that doesn't make you a good driver for the rest of your life. But what we got to watch out for is bad becoming normal. And we got into a bad problem that with the dairy cow. We got the 25% lane. People got used to looking at them. They weren't seeing them. Then in Wisconsin, Nigel Cook started getting people to measure it, and it dropped down to 5%. You manage what you measure. Now, I've done a lot of work on designing auditing things. And you can't have a guideline that says handle them properly or give them adequate space. I don't know what that means. I got to have a clear guidance that is like, um, the traffic rules, stop signs mean stop. There's a limit on the number of your drunk driving test. You see, this is stuff where it's very, very clear. Okay, we're at the Public Policy Institute. There's a lot of verbal gobbledygook. <laughs> and then the Supreme Court's got to fight over it because it's not clear. Well, I'm going to be showing a guideline I did for meat plants that we put into action just over 20 years ago with McDonald's. And when you got big customers making them do it, it works. But we made them do sensible things using a very clear guideline. For example, um, all the pigs have to be able to lie down at the same time without being on top of each other. That's clear. It doesn't say adequate space. Now, if you're scoring animal handling, I can measure how many animals run during handling, how many fall down during handling, how many vocalize when I catch them in a the squeeze shoot. It should be very low, like 5%. How many did I use an electric prod on? These are things that I can measure. And this is the beef quality assurance on animal handling measurements. It's based on scoring systems that I 
that I made. And this is some data that my former student, Ruth Woolley-Woldy, collected. And these are really good scores, because it used to be 500% would get the electric prod put on them. If you've got a lot of really terrible stuff going on, you'll have 30% mooing when you catch them in the squeeze chute, because you're frying them with an electric prod, slamming the head gate on their head. You know, you, but the trick is figuring out which things to measure. You don't measure 100 different things. You measure what's called a critical control point. Like, for example, uh, on the farm, one critical control point would be lameness. Well, there's probably 10 different things that can make animals lame. But the thing I measure is the lameness. Then the managers and the veterinarians have got to fix the stuff. But lameness is the critical control point, not a particular foot disease or a genetic problem with leg conformation. They both make the cow lame. This is the American Meat Institute basic critical control points. These are the five things we measured in meat packing plants. And in 1999, I was hired by McDonald's to implement this. And I saw more change than I'd seen in my entire career prior to that. In fact, Bob Langert, the person I worked for at McDonald's, he has a book called The Battle to Do Good by Bob Langert. The Battle to Do Good. I think it's a book that ought to be in your public policy library. And I do not get any royalties from The Battle to Do Good. Because we did stuff that actually worked. So you measure how many animals did you stun correctly on the first shot. That's obvious. Everything better be dead before you cut it up. And then we measured the same handling things we measured before. But they're outcome variables. I'm not telling you how to build a plant. I am measuring outcomes. OK, what am I going to do about the factory in Croatia? I'm already figuring out my, my system for $10 and $15 drugs. And I'm going to have a really good quality assurance lab. And I'm not going to be so stupid as to pull the boxes off the top of the pallet where they put the good stuff on it. You see, I'm saying that. I'll know tomorrow whether or not this drug worked. And you better believe it. I'm concerned about this. And I'm concerned about antibiotic resistance. I am somebody that would have been dead long a long time ago if antibiotics had not worked, starting with pneumonia at age six, starting with a very scary uh, hemorrhagic urinary tract infection at the Chicago airport that was so scary beyond belief. I broke into the Cipro. I worked, thank goodness. Uh, OK, now the thing is, you have a good auditing program. What it needs to do is if I audit a plant, or you audit a plant, or you audit a plant, we get the same scores. That's what's called inter-observer reliability. OK, if the police, two different policemen use the same radar device, or maybe it's a LIDAR device now, I've got to get modern on the technology, use the same piece of equipment to <coughs> measure the speed, do you get <coughs> scores that are almost the same? Inter-observer reliability. Are you going to give me a cough drop? Well, maybe I'm going to be bad and have a cough drop. Uh, and if the drug works, we can thank the hardworking people in Croatia. And maybe when they have a wedding, their friends stay at the Double Tree Inn. I looked at that up last night. And eat those cookies they give out at the Double Tree Inn. You see, that is visual thinking. I looked up some pretty places to visit in the, in the, in the capital city of, uh, in Croatia. They've got some nice places to visit. I just hope their factory's got some decent quality control because I, feel, I don't feel all that good right now. Now, I have a reason to be concerned about this. This is stuff that's real. You see, when you're a visual thinker, nothing's abstract. Nothing's ideology. It's real. Let's talk about health care. People rationing insulin and dying because they cannot afford to buy insulin? Yeah, I don't think about it abstractly. Now, in 1996, I collected baseline data for the US Department of Agriculture on stunning. It was disgusting. Only 30% of the plants could shoot 95% dead on the first shot because the stunner was broken. Broken. That is management. Then you got a big company like McDonald's and Wendy's getting after them. You're going to see change. Now, the good news is, is that out of 75 suppliers. 
Only three had to build expensive stuff. We did a whole lot of non-slip flooring. We did a lot of stuff with lighting and with solid panels and training people. The other thing that was interesting was taking the executives from McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King and other country, companies on their first trips to farms and slaughter plants. And I saw reactions just like that show, Undercover Boss. I saw those exact same reactions. And I'll never forget when the uh, head of one of the McDonald's people saw a decrepit, half-dead dairy cow go into their product. And they go, yeah, we got to do something. I watched animal welfare go from an abstraction that you give to the legal department. You give it to the public relations department. You just waste a lot of money on lawsuits suing an activist group. Go to something real. But the good news, I'm really proud of the fact, is that we didn't have to rebuild the plants. We mainly had to repair them, do simple changes, and make people manage the plants. We also had to get rid of three plant managers. Manager ectomy. And <coughs> the principle here is figuring out what are the critical control points. A good critical control point will locate a multiple problems. Lameness is a really good example. There's 10 different things that make cattle or pigs lame. The critical control point's lameness, not the leg conformation. Okay, I have to correct the leg conformation, or they've got a hoof disease, or they are on, I've been fed so much grain and they messed them up. You know, those would all be things that could make them lame. Or the dairy cow's stall is too small and she's tearing up her hocks on the concrete. Now, as I say each one of these things, I see it. Hazard analysis critical control points, food safety concept. It's directly observable. It's not a paperwork audit. I'm not big on paperwork audits. I've caught everybody how to cheat records, how to cheat. You ought to look at the stuff on Pacific Gas and Electric. Yeah, burned up a whole town because they didn't keep trees off of power lines. They were masters of fake records, too. Big full page spread in Wall Street Journal. I can then also measure how um, handling improved when I made a simple change, such as stopping air blowing out through the entrance of the chute. And I change it, and then I can measure vocalization and prod score before and after when I make a simple change or I changed the lighting. The pigs are now willing to go into the chute because I duct taped the light to the chute. This is my um, center track restrainer system right here. And one of the things I had to do is deal with what's called the visual cliff effect. This whole apparatus was seven feet off the floor. And you don't want the cattle looking down and going, ah, it's a cliff. Because animals can see the visual cliff effect. So what I, this is the old apparatus for testing the visual cliff effect in animals and in babies. They will not walk out over a piece of glass, sort of like the sky bridge at the Grand Canyon, where you can see the cliff underneath. So I put in a false floor that would be about six inches below their feet. So as they went in, it gave the illusion of a floor to walk on. And then plants would take it off because they didn't want to clean it, and then it wouldn't work. So then I'd have to go back there and put it back on again because they couldn't see a why that piece of metal had to be there. Now here's situations where I reduced vocalization, doing simple things. Install the light on the entrance. I reduced pressure on the neck. This is super simple stuff. But the thing is, people aren't seeing it. There's just an example of putting the light on the chute entrance. Uh, there's differences in animals. Some animals are much easier to handle than other animals. You can have leg conformation problems. You can have feet additives. You gave them too many feet additives. Um, nobody ever walked in the pens. I'll never forget the one pig plan I went to 10 years ago. And they had to have five or six full-time people to handle all the down non-ambulatory pigs. It was just disgusting. Then we made three changes. We made the producers walk the pens because a finishing pig differentiates between a person in the alley and a person actually in their pen. You got to go in the pens, walk around, get them used to moving away from you. And then we reduced the ractopamine use. We didn't ban it, but we reduced it. And the other thing, uh, uh, the other thing they did is they got rid of a genetic bore line that had really awful leg conformation. And then they went down to half a person handling downers. 
and the problem had to be fixed at the farm, not at the plant. The, the, wasn't the plant co was not causing it. Now, there's kind of three types of variables, and the trend now is to go more towards animal-based outcome guidelines, like I'm going to measure skinny dairy cows, lame dairy cows. Then you have some practices that we just don't allow, because what you got to remember is you cannot escape this thing here. You don't want to get photographed, you know, beating pigs up with a gate rod or something like that. And not so many engineering variables. Now, there are some exceptions to this, uh, especially in pigs and in laying hens, where some of the housing systems have to be changed. That is an input variable. But this is just an example here of um, animal-based outcome measures, body condition, uh, lameness, dirty animals. Injuries like swollen hocks on dairy cattle because the stalls are too small. Coat condition. Okay, organic people. Lice in the spring is not okay. We're going to evaluate that. High ammonia levels, that actually is an input measure because I don't want to do the outcome because damaged eyes are like too nasty. Let's get it down to 10 parts per million. And then abnormal behaviors, much more of an issue with pigs than it would be with cattle. Now, lameness, again, I said, look at all the different stuff that can make them lame. And then here's some practices of that things that in some systems now, sow to station stalls, that's a really controversial issue. Docking dairy cows. I think on everything we do, if you bring 10 people out from the O'Hara airport, what would they think? Sow stalls, it doesn't fly with the public, period. That's come up on every survey. It came up with a survey I did, a little informal survey I did years ago on the airlines. Um, you know, we still need to do some space requirement, you know, input measures. And then I get to my last slide, and now we got plenty of time for questions, and if nobody raises their hand, I'm going to just kind of come down and pick somebody. And I know, uh, you, know you know, a lot of people are bashful about asking questions. And you can ask questions about autism, you can ask questions about animals, but I want to tell you, you young people in the future, you're the future. And if you get into policy petitions, you better get your butt out of the office and find out what's going on in the field. You can read this stuff about Pacific Gas and Electric. They became masters at gaming their own computer system. I know people have gotten masters at faking electronic feed records, where they're doing stuff with feed they shouldn't be doing, and they have FDA-approved records and they're all fake. I had someone teach me how to do that. I'm not going to teach you guys how to do that. That's the kind of stuff you got to make sure it's not going on. By getting out of the office, getting out in the field, you get in charge of stuff when you grow up, you better, get, I call it, drag those suits out of the office so that any policy you make is real. Am I going to get better on my stuff from Croatia with one dose of it? I'm not sure. And I am concerned about my health right now. I, and I'm going to if I get worse, I'm going to go right straight to the doctor when I get home tomorrow. I don't know. I'm on the end of the dose now. That's something real. Let's say I couldn't afford the medicine. I might die. All right, let's get real. I have a question over here. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Island Martin, and I was wondering, we were talking about cows a few weeks ago in animal science. I was wondering, when is the only exceptional time Wait a minute, part to cross of this, cows? There's a reverberation. I'm having a hard time understanding what's being said. I may have to somebody. I do have a little bit of an auditory processing problem. Okay, something about animal science. Can someone just yell it w without a microphone? What is basically the question? Only time to crossbreed cows? I, well, people crossbreed cows all the time. Um, I don't understand what the question is on the time, the time to do that. Um, we have all kinds of crossbred cattle, and you all know about hybrid vigor. You have a, you know, you got a sire, and you got, you know, moms, and and you sell off the offspring. Yeah, I don't know what the question is on the time to crossbreed them. Yeah, maybe I'm. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I really don't know how to answer that. Let's get another question. Yeah, I got a question over here. 
See, I can't tell where the sound's coming from. Okay, right there, all righty. What was going through your head the moment you decided to change the design for Slaughterhouse? Wait a minute, now what was the movie? Well, okay, first of all, I didn't just change everything overnight. I started my business with getting in the chutes and seeing what the cattle were seeing. Then I did my master's thesis on different squeeze chute designs that already existed and seeing how that affected cattle behavior. And I saw that there were some differences. And then I got the opportunity to do those big dip vat projects. And that's a situation where an opportunity came and I walked through the door. I got asked if I would design those dip vats and I said, give me three weeks. I was about at the 60% level of competence. Man, I scurried around because I had to get the drawings for how to do the concrete reinforcement for the dip vat. I had no idea how to do that. But I took the job at the 60% level, and then I very quickly brought myself up to the 90% level. Now, I've seen some people just try to wing it. I didn't do that. But when these opportunities come up, that door opens for like five seconds. Then you've got to have the guts to walk through it. Another reason why I'm talking about writing Writing was an important part of my career. And in the HBO movie, I walked up to the editor and I got his card, and then I started writing for the magazine. My writing had been terrible. Um, I wouldn't be writing for magazines. You know, it's, it's that simple. So I started out, you know, one little project at a time, and I found that selling equipment was a whole lot easier than getting people to actually operate it correctly. That was kind of a shock for me. And I was very, we put these restrainers in, early 90s. Uh, some of my clients did, were okay on how they operated, but half my clients would break the hydraulics on it and not fix it and like abuse cattle in it. And the thing that really changed things is it was the McDonald's era. In six months, I saw more change than I'd seen in my whole entire career 25 years prior to that simply by repairs of equipment. And we took some old shabby plants and we made them work. And then we had three places that were hopeless and we had to remodel them, expensive. But my, I went from an engineering mentality where I thought I could do everything with engineering to much more of a management uh, mentality. But my business started out one little thing at a time. I was always a freelancer and you build up the business. And then I wrote about the projects. You see, and that was a very important thing in my career. And right now, today, I'm seeing some really awful writing skills. We got graduate students right now where I have to copy edit and correct their papers. They, be, they need to be taught things that you guys need to be learning right now. Found out they never wrote book reports when they were kids, where you have to summarize a book and then critique it, and then have it all marked, paper marked up, and a, le and a teacher puts red marks all over it, and then you go back and correct the grammar. That's how I learned how to write. When you're in government policy, you're going to need to know how to write, clearly, without, you know, gobbledygook talk. Dr. Grandin, yep. I am in the back near the camera. You okay? Uh, I have another question for you. As someone with Asperger's and autism, how would you recommend someone to proceed with their aspirations uh, as young as 20 or younger? And uh, how would you recommend it for them to proceed if, if, let's say, their aspiration is computers? How would you recommend someone like that? How would I recommend doing with an Asperger kid that's in his 20s? I'm in my 20s. I'm actually Okay, 20. you got Asperger's right now? Yes, ma'am. Well, they're still going to need people to run cameras and work in TV stations. Yes, ma'am. That's something that, that um, you know, that's a decent career. You're always going to need photographers. Um, and I think it's really good that you've got a job now running the camera. Because one of the big problems I'm seeing now of young Asperger students, I'm seeing them graduate with honors from high school, graduate honors from college, and lose it in the workplace because they never had jobs. And then the other big issue, I hope you know how to drive. Good. Because that's another issue. See, there's multitasking problems in Asperger's. And so learning to drive is going to take longer. I did 200 miles on dirt roads before I did any traffic. Let's spend more time learning how to operate the car. But the biggest problem I'm seeing with smart Asperger kids is not learning work skills. 
For students that are in the pipeline right now, I want two real summer jobs successfully completed before they graduate. And we do have to be careful about multitasking, because the way the autistic mind is, you got the Amazon cloud back here, but you're accessing it through a one-bar phone or through a dial-up. And so multitasking is hard. So super crazy busy McDonald's would not be a very good first job choice. Also, any job that requires sequence, like, okay, setting up your camera, the thing that would help you on that is a pilot's checklist. I cannot remember verbal sequence. I have no working memory, so I have to do a workaround. And when I worked in a dairy in graduate school, they had, they had put a checklist on the wall for the milking equipment set up and clean up. I would have been dead without that checklist. Those are simple things that you can do. Now, originally, I was going to be an experimental psychologist. And when I was in college, that's what I was studying. And if someone said I'd be designing slaughterhouses, I would have said, you're crazy. So sometimes careers can take turns. But my psychology work helped me in my cattle behavior work. This also shows the importance of cross-disciplinary. So OK, in your situation, you're, do you like TV station stuff? Well, then go into that field then. Go do it. Go for it. This brings up another very important thing, doing internships. I recommend to every student to do summer jobs, but I recommend every college student to do internships where you try careers on. And you're going to find out what you like. You're also going to find out what you hate. That's also equally important. A lot of students want to be a veterinarian. And what's happening in our department is um, that's about 75% when they come in. But by the junior year, it drops to 25% because they discover careers that they didn't know existed that you can do with a four-year degree. So try stuff on. We take undergraduates out to the big beef plant. Two love it, one hates it. But two love it that had no background in it. Try these jobs on. But I want to see you going into careers that you are going to like. Us visual thinkers, we're going to be really good at fixing things in skilled trades. Yeah, don't stick your nose up at it. When the doctors have lost their jobs, you'll be fixing the hospital's air conditioning. That's not going to go away. And there's equipment that we don't know how to build right now. The place where my equipment was built no longer makes things anymore. They just fix, shop, uh, fix trucks in that shop now. Yeah, it makes me very, very sad. Yeah, it's fine. They use it. I'm glad they're using it for fixing trucks. The building's still there. Well, when I drive by it, it makes me very, very sad because we're not building things. But, and then you've got your mathematical thinkers, your computer scientists, your more traditional engineering. We can still do building infra infrastructure, but not stuff inside it. Um, get out and try stuff. That's all I can say. Okay, we can do another question. There's a question on the other side <coughs> of the room. Okay. Hi, Dr. Grandin. I was wondering if you still use your hug machine and if other people with autism have used this to help them with their disorder. Well, actually, the hug machine is uh, built right here in Illinois at the Therafin Corporation in Mokina, Illinois. Now, the downside of it is it costs. Now, there's a lot of people using other simpler ways uh, to do pressure, like weighted vests, weighted blankets. Now, not everybody responds to deep pressure. See, one of the problems on studying sensory problems in autism is it's very, very variable. One person has sound sensitivity, another person has touch sensitivity, another person has some visual sensitivity problems. So you try to study it with just an autism diagnosis, they might say, well, it doesn't work. But it does work on a subtype, maybe, you know, 20 percent. See, this, this is the problem. Let's give you some tips on dealing with kids with sound sensitivity. Kids afraid of the vacuum cleaner? Let him play with it, where they turn it on and off, where they control it. OK, if you're dyslexic, there's a subgroup of dyslexic where the print will jiggle on the page. Here's something simple you can try. Colored paper. Print your work on tan, gray, light lavender, light blue, all your pale colors. Experiment with your computer backgrounds. I have seen that save careers. And somebody might say to me, well, that's not evidence-based. 
I'm talking about colored paper here. It's safe, it's cheap, and uh, it, it, it doesn't it cost very much, it's not dangerous. So go ahead and try it. Um, I've seen it work. I want to make it very clear, it's only a subgroup. But those are some simple things you can do. I like simple stuff I can do. Sometimes we get too grandiose on the stuff we want to do. Dr. Grandin, okay. I'm back in the corner, and I have another question. I am standing next to the camera. Okay, right there, all right. Hi, Mrs. Grandin, Dr. Grandin. Um, I actually saw you as a student at the University of Illinois about three years back. I am extremely intrigued by your work. I am currently an ag teacher here in Southern Illinois. And my question for you is, I watched a TED Talk, and you said we as teachers are failing with our special education students. How, as an ag teacher, <coughs> can I evaluate those students and help you them You get them in your successful? class and make them successful, and don't get any, take any BS about it's not safe for special ed students to take welding class, because that's a pile of nonsense. Because when I was out working in construction, you know, remember, I spent 25 years staying in really crummy little hotels, living out there with the crews. The special ed department built the stuff. I'm talking dyslexic, oppositional defiant, autistic, ADHD, get them in your class and make them successful and make them, well, get them doing all kinds of things. So I That's had, what you do. I had an autistic student in my eighth grade ag construction class. How can I make him not afraid of using power tools? All right, let's, okay, let's start with easy ones like little small electric drill. We start with that. And maybe we start with um, two, two little small power tools and he can choose. It's always good to give a choice. See, mother said to me uh, when I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch, and if I had not gone to my aunt's ranch, I would not be here now because that's where I got exposed to beef cattle. She gave me a choice. I could go all summer or I could go for a week. Not going wasn't one of the choices. Well, maybe give him a choice of two little power tools so he can pick the one he tries first. No, but you are going to try one. I would start, you know, small electric drill, probably, you know, one of them. Um, um, and he's already used a hand drill. Then you try the small electric one. And then have him, like a soft pine board, something that would be easy to drill. You see, now as I'm ta talking to you about this, I'm actually seeing it. I'm actually seeing the tool, and then I was thinking about something easy to drill. No, and, and I'd let them have a choice. No, we are going to try it. You see, there's a tendency to not stretch these kids. You have to stretch. We don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool, like take for a first job, super crazy, busy McDonald's. That's throwing in the deep end of the pool. You know, a big, scary uh, power tool, we don't start there. But we have to stretch. And if we don't stretch just outside their comfort zone, they won't develop. Stretch and give choices. This is my last question for you. On the same boy, I gave them a, a project. They could pick any project they wanted to do in the shop. He picked a shelf. When he was doing the shelf, it had to be exactly like the picture. Would that be a visual autistic quality? Well, they, the visual thinkers are often very good at drawing. And when they do get over their fear of power tools, this is the kid that can build anything out of metal that we need him to make, you know, the next, you know, farm uh, uh, implements. I mean, take something like the round baler, for example. You know, you used to just shove hay in a square box, and now you're going to wind it up. You see, that's, that's a totally new idea. That's the kind of ideas that visual thinkers uh, often make up. Also, what's he good at? If he's failing algebra, he's probably a visual thinker. He loved to paint. Now, I've, what kind of painting? Uh, just uh, Like whenever uh, um, he made the shelf, which to his, I had to help him, but it seemed like he was satisfied with it. Good. He had to paint it a certain way, and it had to be all white. But he was really good at getting all the crevices and everything. Well, that's good. And then we gradually go to more complicated projects than making shelves. My first woodworking project was in fifth grade. It was a violin plant stool where he took a little piece of a thin quarter-inch pine, cut out, used the coping saw, and I've got a book called Calling All Minds, which is my childhood projects, 
And the purpose of the project was to teach you how to use the little coping saw to, you know, to cut things out. And then you gradually go on to other projects. And you don't know until you expose them. Um, is his reading level at grade level? Uh, I mean, he participated in class fine. But he could not de de or deal with the noise. Well, the noise thing, okay, part of the problem with the power tools may be noise. And, but you see, he, he's going to control that electric drill. So, you, you see, this is the same problem like with a, a piece of equipment like a hairdryer, for example. He's got to turn it on. He's going to control it. And if it's too noisy, then he can shut it off. You could also wear ear protectors. But the problem, if you wear ear protectors all the time, your hearing is going to get more sensitive. You'll increase your, your, your hearing sensitivity, make it worse. But part of the problem is be the noise. But let's just start out, if it's a noise, you're going to just turn on the electric drill for one second. That's all you do. <coughs> Before you drill, just get him used to turning it on and off in the air if you think it's noise sensitivity. Okay, you can turn it on for like half a second. You control it. And then, and then, then he gets to where he can tolerate more and more of it, where he's controlling that drill going on and off. Instead of saying, you're going to have to have it on to drill the whole board, let's just start off with desensitizing to the noise. Then we'll do the board. You see, we have to figure out, is, he just, is the problem afraid to try something new, or is it noise sensitivity? And noise sensitivity, I'm going to have to go through a desensitization period where there won't be any board. We're going to just do the drill, turning it on and off. And I'd pick one that wasn't the biggest noise maker. Thank you. To start with. OK, right here. Yeah, I can hear you. I'll repeat your question, so make it really short. What made me, how did I switch from psychology to animals? Um, well, I, I was originally wanted to be an experimental psychologist, and the thing I wanted to study was optical system perceives optical illusions. I was very interested in how, you know, you see stuff. And, that, and I took one year of a master's at Arizona State towards psychology. That was a disaster. I got a C minus in statistics. And they had an animal science department there. And there was a very nice professor there named Philip Stiles. This is where there are certain teachers that are really important. And Philip uh, invited me to come and take his introductory animal science class and sort of just let me in the back door. Um, I had a very good contractor friend that helped me, who seeked me out because he'd seen some of my drawings. My high school science teacher was really good. But things didn't go that well in the psych department at Arizona State. We were in the height of the B.F. Skinner era, where everything was operant conditioning. Well, I'd taken a class in, as an undergraduate at Franklin Pierce from Tom Evans. He was an animal ethologist, where you study the natural instinctual behaviors of animals. So I didn't, under, I didn't believe all that operant conditioning stuff. And, and then I just sort of, uh, things didn't go well in that first year in the, uh, in the, towards the masters, and I switched over to animal science. You know, sometimes your career can change course, but the thing that stays the same, visual. I wanted to study visual stuff in psychology, and then I just switched that over to cattle. And my optical illusion training uh, made me think about things like, well, maybe that shadow, the cow thinks it's a hole in the ground. Now, there's actually been some research that that's probably what the cow thinks it is. Because in a dairy, for example, the old cows will walk over the shadow. They know it won't hurt them. The shadow, you have 3 o'clock milking, but the new heifers will all stop at it. Enough times you don't know where your, your career is going to go. This is why with internships, you go to college, you do every internship you can do. Find out what you love, find out what you hate. Sometimes you don't know where you're going to go. Sometimes a door opens, and Philip Stiles opened the door, and I went through it. And well, thank you, Philip Stiles. And there's a bunch of other people. Thank you, Jim Ool, the contractor. Gary Oden and, and Ted Gilbert at Two Feed Guards. There were some good people. There were bad people that put bull testicles on my car. And the bad people were mainly at the foreman level, that level of management just under the big owners of the feed yards. 
The, it was the level of management just under a plant manager at a big plant. Do we wrap it up? Okay. Well, I think it's time to wrap it up, and thank you all for coming. Dr. Grandin, thank you for coming to speak to us today, and thank you for all the work that you do for the agriculture industry and those affected by autism. On behalf of SIU Carbondale and the College of Agricultural Sciences, I'd like to present to you this Saluki as a small token oh, of I, our appreciation. I found out what a Saluki was today, I didn't know what it was. 